The sun had set far enough that the remaining yellow was now a lie that the seawater told the sky, and that the sky reflected in tones of pink and purple, announcing to Luanda that it would tell no more by the powerful light of the sun which bathed it every day. Since night was falling now, and people turned on their fluorescent lights on their porches, not only to provide light for their children's games, but to gradually let the cicadas chime in with their vibrato, awakening the toads, stirring up the fireflies, lulling to sleep the hot stones, making the elders on the Wanda Island, both fishermen and their aging wives, tighten their casual clothes around their bodies and light up their cigarettes and bongs, which feed dreams and delight the lungs with a marvelous calm for those who enjoy it. Hey there humans, my name is Mangarthia and today we're talking about Transparent City by Aunt Jackie. Now, this book was translated from the original Portuguese. It's an Angolan novel set in the capital city of Luanda, which is right here on this globe. I don't think that you can read this globe very well because of, you know, it's a decorative globe that's a good solid seven feet away from my GoPro camera. But that's how we do it here. That's how we YouTubes. Uh, I've got myself, my GoPro, and my dog. Hi, dog. Okay, so a little bit about the author. As a uh, way of background, on well, Jackie is, um, he kind of represents this new generation of Angolan authors who are kind of taking their place in the literary scene as people who, you know, didn't grow up under the colonial rule of the Portuguese, but did grow up during the massive civil war post that colonial rule. And a lot of what's considered major Angolan literature is written by people who took part in that civil war and who were, you know, already figures in some way, shape or another before uh, Angolan independence, really, in the, in the grand history of things, it's really only been a few years that Angola hasn't been at war with itself. And that, you know, a lot of that can be attributed to Portugal. Uh, <laughs> um, and Jackie really is kind of spearheading the next generation of writers whose work is indelibly marked by that civil war, but exemplifies after that. So when Jackie's work really kind of manifests this, um, this present day and futurality in, um, that could, like, it's, it is both what is happening in Angolan literature now and in a lot of ways, a sneak peek of what is coming up as more and more people get involved in the literary scene. And I think that's pretty cool. Also, on Jackie was my professor, and I feel like that means I can say whatever I want about him, but I know that that's not true. So yeah, my personal opinion on on Jackie is that he's pretty fabulous. I was terrified of him as a professor, I'm not gonna lie. He was um, the visiting professor in my PhD program at, during my very first semester in my PhD program. And I was terrified in general, but particularly terrified of him because he came in as a novelist, as a creative writer, and I had just finished an MFA in creative writing program. And I, I don't know, more so than, it felt like more so than the other professors I was having that semester, I wanted to like make him proud because he was a writer and I was a writer. But at the same time, I had never before taken a class taught exclusively in Portuguese and I was struggling <laughs> but it was so worthwhile because eventually by the end of the semester I felt a lot I felt so much more comfortable with my abilities in the Portuguese language as a speaker and as a writer of it and obviously I wasn't great at it necessarily um, compared to you know some of the other folks in the class but I was much better at it at the end of the semester than I was at the beginning of the semester. And 
I credit a lot of that to the fact that Onjaki would pick on me about speaking Portuguese versus English in class. Like, not in a mean way or anything, but, you know, just a, just a little bit of needling to, you know, push, expand my comfort zone and push my boundaries. And so I'm always going to be like, yeah, Onjaki's cool, if you ask me, because uh, Onjaki's cool. He's a cool dude. And his writing is great, too. So it's not just me having a personal opinion based on knowing a person. It is also me as a person who likes literature saying this is a good book and the other stuff I've read by him is good, too. So let's talk about this book in particular and what makes this book good. It's hard to explain what makes this book good because there's so much going on in this book. But to summarize... Uh, Transparent City features an ensemble cast of characters, primarily focusing around the, the residents of one apartment building that's got six floors, each floor is a separate apartment. And the, there's one floor the, on, in the building that has a burst water pipe and is completely flooded over. So the various plots, subplots, and mini plots that happen throughout the book are tied to this building because of this building's water situation. There's a flooded floor while the rest of the city is in drought. And so the people who live in the building as well as the, so, several of the other minor characters and major political figures just stop by this building and hop in hop in the flooded water every once in a while to cool down because it's you know it's it's summer in Luanda and it's hot mechanically speaking there's recently been discovered a new oil reserve underneath Luanda Bay and a large part of the book revolves around the question of are they going to drill in Luanda Bay for oil or not because oil is one of the major um, exports of Angola and the Angolan economy is tied very closely to the success of their oil company and the oil business. So that, that does mirror real life, but it is also a fictional potential oil drill. And that that tension between what's best for the city and what's best for the country really comes to a head in that question of will you dig, will you drill for oil in the Wanda Bay or not? And that big question gets enacted almost in a certain way in the lives of the city dwellers, how would these choices affect their lives? And, or not, depending on what's going on. But again, that's not the whole plot of the book. That's one plot of the book. Another plot of the book is the drought itself and the rising cost of water in Luanda. And whether or not the water industry is going to privatize and if it's going to privatize the water or if it's going to privatize the pipes that carry the water. And there's an important distinction there because water is, is essential, but the pipes that carry the water, not as much. And so, in between getting to know the people who live in this apartment building and the people who hang out around this apartment building, we're also entering into these backroom dealings regarding the water, regarding the oil, and seeing how, how those changes would affect people's lives on a very real personal scale. And again, that's not the only plot of the book nor is it the most important plot of the book. And I honestly don't even know if there is a most important part plot of the book, 
other than the main character Odonato and his personal struggle struggle for self acceptance, self realization, self acknowledgement, but mostly he's just trying to make amends with his um, miscreant vagabond son, um, his criminal son. I don't want to sound judgmental of Ciente the Grand, but Ciente the Grand is a bad dude who does bad things, and he does them poorly. He's not a criminal mastermind. He's more like a henchman without a leader to follow, if that makes sense. Like, he'd do really well in the service of Dr. No, but there is no Dr. No for him to serve. <laughs> and, and that gets him into trouble. And so, so... I honestly wouldn't even think that that's the that Odonato's plot line is the biggest plot line, but it is certainly the most emotionally central plot line. Because all of the stuff about the water, all the stuff about the oil, it's important to all of the characters in the book. But the person in all that it is in an ensemble cast, the person that we do get closest to is Odonato. And Odonato is, he's a father, he's a husband, he's a son-in-law. And he really places his identity in his relationships with his wife, his mother-in-law, his daughter, and his son. And the fact that he doesn't have a good relationship with his son, it it's, eating him alive. So for the first part of the book, a large portion of it is just w us walking along with Onato as he tries to reconnect with his criminal son. And then when things go for the worst, it's him trying to protect his criminal son. Him trying to make that connection happen again in a way that hadn't happened in a long time. And ultimately, I think that's what Transparency is about. It's about the connections between people that sometimes go invisible, but that are central to, to what makes a healthy society, what makes a healthy community work. And It ain't the oil industry, let, let's say that. <laughs> but, um, oh. Okay, so let's talk about the translation. Let's talk about the dog! <laughs> okay, we're gonna start this over. So let's talk about the translation. I'm fortunate enough for this book and hopefully more in the future um, to have both the original Portuguese version and the English translation on hand. So that, and since I can speak and read both of these languages, thanks on Jackie, I can compare and contrast a little bit. And what I see in this translation is just some masterful craftsmanship in the translation itself. And that's because Onjaki's writing style is one that it mirrors kind of the, the choices made by Faulkner or the choices made by Saramago for a Portuguese context in that there is the, the grammar is hinky, the naming style is also hinky, and it's just, it's, it's craft choices that are difficult to translate effectively. And I think that Hennigan, the translator, Stephen Hennigan, does a really good job of analyzing what it is that Onjaki is saying and what he means to be saying through that in order to create a strong and simultaneously beautiful translation. He's he finds his way to the heart of the text 
instead of just transmutating it directly into English the way that I think would be an easy mistake for a translator to make with a book like on Jackie's and or with a writer like on Jackie because there is there is a level of technical finesse to his writing that requires an equal level of technical finesse in the translation. Okay, so let's take a look at what I mean by that a little bit more closely and pull out some names from Transparent City. The first one we're going to look at is Vendedor de Conchas. And in Onjaki's writing, in this book and in others, he has a set of naming conventions where minor characters or side characters, instead of receiving a proper name, will receive kind of a moniker. And this kid's moniker, if you were to translate it as literally as possible, I would call it Seller of Shells. And what Vendelor the Conscious do, does for a living is he collects seashells on the beach, cleans them up, turns them into jewelry, and sells them to tourists. So he's got more to his character than just that, but that's his primary occupation. <laughs> Forget that one. And if if I were Hennigan, and what Hennigan does do is he translates this as seashell seller. And I like that translation a lot because it to me it keys into she sells she sell she sells seashells by the seashore. Um, the tongue twister. And that it gives it like that English connection that I think really aids the translation. And notice there's no spaces in on Jackie's names. Here we've got Maria Conforza, and just like Vendador de Conchas, there's no spaces in these names between these words, but Hennigan is going to put them back in. So if I were to translate Maria Conforza as literally as possible, we would get Maria with strength, or Maria with force, but uh, let's go with strength today. And what Hennigan does is he takes that concept of a woman who is strong or who has strength and he calls her Strong Maria, which is a very apt name for this character. So let's take a look at a couple more names. And these ones are a little bit more com complex than the first two. So we're going to look at Siente Zugran, who is... Um, Odonatu's son who gets in some legal trouble throughout the book. And Siente du Gran is a shortened nickname of Siente du Gran, Cher du Gran Cherokee. So the cigarette brand, Grand Cherokee. And he gets that nickname from his pals because of the cigarettes that he smokes. And some other reasons, I do believe. Um, but you can find those out for yourself. So if I were to take that full title as literally as possible, it would be Siente of the Grand Cherokee, which is already a mouthful, which is why even in the original, his pals have shortened it to Siente du Grand. And if we were to shorten it the exact same way, it would come out as Siente of the Grand. And that just doesn't sound as good as what Hennigan actually does. And what he does is he takes that feeling of being, you know, wanting to make yourself seem more powerful. And he hyphenates these words to Siente the Grand, because it's not just a moniker from Monjaki, it is a moniker from Siente himself. And it just shows that that's what he wants to be known as. So we're going to look at one more name. And this one is the most abstract kind of translation, but it makes also the most sense. So the character's name is Ze Mejmu. And if you say something like Eu Mejmu, I'm talking about myself. But um, the word Mejmu itself just literally translates to same. So the best literal translation for this name would just be Ze himself. Or if you are Google Translate, which I don't even know if Google Translate would do this, but 
a, a translation software might show you they the same. Yeah, no. But either way, what Stephen Hennigan does is he pulls out the real Zay. And what the real Zay communicates is this kind of like, I am the only Zay that you need to know about, which is the same feeling. So yeah, with just those few examples, it's easy to see that this translator knows what he's doing and is really honoring these characters and the characters are the heart of the novel. Do I recommend this book strongly? Strongly. I think that it's got something in it for everyone. If you like political intrigue and political drama, you've got that. If you like um, get rich quick schemes or romance or um, wacky neighborly hijinks, you've got that. If you if you read The Handsomest Strong Man in the World in college and decided that you were going to marry Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you've got that. It's got, it really does, it has, something, it has something for everyone in terms of its story and its characters and its narration. And it's, I think, a really good entry point into contemporary African literature for, um, for a Western or American based audience because it is such an engaging book and the characters are so realized. And even with no prior knowledge of Angola or Luanda and its history, you can enter into this book and engage with it and enjoy it. If you do have that background though, and you do know something about the Angolan oil industry, you're gonna have an even bigger blast of the time because it's, you know, it's all over the book. <laughs> and, but you don't need to know the history to know that, um, to enjoy that line of in that line of inquiry that that through line of the of the oil in the Wanda Bay like again the heart of it is that there are potential changes coming to this city and the people in this city are going to experience this change one way or another and it's is it a good change? Is it a bad change? Is it a neutral change? You know, and what exactly does change mean for a community? And how do communities evolve over time? Hi, Doggo. The dog is back. This is Zeus. He's the channel dog. From now on, from that, henceforth and forevermore, this is the channel dog. <laughs>